Welcome to the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast with your host, Tony Guerra. The Pharmacy Leaders Podcast is a member of the Pharmacy Podcast Network with interviews and advice on building your professional network, brand, and a purposeful second income from students, residents, and innovative professionals. At Drake, it all starts with you, and it starts in your first semester. Together, we'll build a path toward your career vision and goals. Whether you're a student in pharmacy, occupational therapy, athletic training, or pursuing other health sciences careers, you can prepare for a career in areas as diverse as patient care, management, public health, research, and more. Drake is where an immersive curriculum combined with community service and a vast alumni network enrich and challenge you long before you walk across the stage at graduation. This is where you build the unshakable foundation that lasts a lifetime. Hi, my name is Caroline Jones. I am a current P1 at Drake University, and I'm here to talk today with Dr. Lynn Castle and Dr. Abe Mangesha about the research opportunities that we have had at Drake. So for Dr. Castle, um, both are professors at Drake University. So I'm going to ask how long have you been at Drake? What is your title? And when did you first get the chance to become involved in research in your education or career? This is my fourth year uh, being a faculty member at Drake University, and I this is my eighth year being a faculty member uh, in any college of pharmacy or school of pharmacy in the in the country. I have I hold the title of assistant professor of clinical sciences, so I'm a pharmacist by training, and I did a additional graduate education particularly to get more clinical experience, but also to get some research experience. And my first research experience was as a fourth year pharmacy student, so in my fourth professional year, and I was invited to collect data for a current resident at the time. And I really liked the routine of it, but also seeing what came out of it at the end instead of just digging in the chart and finding specific lab values or reading notes, but what did the resident then do with that data to show what she needed to show for her research idea? So that was my first experience. Great. All right. Um, I have been here since 2011, so that is my eighth year now. Um, and my title is an associate professor um, of pharmaceutics. So my training is in uh, pharmaceutical technology. So I did my PhD in uh, Germany, University of Tübingen. Um, yeah, my research is more on uh, design and development of uh, drug delivery system. Um, so that is usually you know, studying the stability of the drug, whether it is released from the drug. Uh, and how it is uh, affect during storage, uh, production, and transport, and so on. So, how can we improve um, the delivery system, like controlled release or sustained release, um, or targeted release? That's the type of research that I usually do. Great, thank you. So, Dr. Castle, Dr. Mangesha, and I are all on a current research project together, so we are going to discuss that right now. All right, Caroline, can you tell us how did you find out about the project and why were you interested in participating? Yeah, so um, at Drake we have a class where we um, learn about professional development before we're in the pharmacy program. And I first became interested in research by hearing a professor come into that class and talk about it. And I found out the project about this project that week, actually. Um, I believe it was um, the same week. They sent out an email on the CPHS announcements, an email that we get each week. Um, and that described the project and how to apply. So I emailed you, Dr. Castle, about whether or not I could apply. And here we are now. <laughs> <laughs> and I was mainly interested just um, to be able to learn about what research really was. And um, I've been fortunate to start it this early. Oh, great. Um, so as a student, uh, what's your role in, in this research project? In this research project, um, a lot of what I've been doing is working with you, Dr. Mangesha, in the lab and also um, independently in the lab to test epinephrine auto-injectors to determine their concentrations. And this work, I've been able to take my work from the lab and clinically apply that with Dr. Castle's expertise also. And we've been able to um, apply that into different presentations and posters and oral presentations about it. 
Uh, Carolyn, can you tell us what opportunities you've had through this research? Um, maybe expand more on some of those presentations. You did a fellowship at Drake University. Can you talk a little bit more about those? Yes, so um, a lot of what we've done is a few presentations. Um, we took a poster project to the American College of Clinical Pharmacy National Meeting in Seattle, which was this past October, and we were able to present on our research there. In addition to that, we've also been able to present at Drake University's own research conference as well as the Des Moines University's research conference um, and be able to share our work and um, discuss it with others in the field. We, I also did apply for the Drake University Summer Research Fellowship, and we did receive that fellowship. So we got to study this research project full time for um, one summer. So, uh, Caroline, what advice do you have for students that may be interested um, in doing research? I would say for students that may be interested in research, just, just to talk to professors that um, you might be interested in the projects and their own research interests and to just put yourself out there and talk to them because you never know what opportunities might arise or what you might find an interest in, even though you may not believe that it's something you're interested in at that point. So now I have some questions for both of you. <laughs> and so um, at what year or age do you typically see students become involved in research projects? I, I get questions about this from my advisees as early as their first year or their sophomore year at Drake. And so they're not even into the professional program yet. And I think it uh, has to do with the push and the competitiveness of residency programs these days and students want to be prepared and they also want to make the most of their entire uh, college experience and so they're excited to get more involved even earlier and I'm really impressed by that uh, but it's also it kind of intimidating to know that <laughs> students who are uh, first years or sophomores are really interested in that and and want to get involved. On the other side of that I have third and fourth year students that I work with uh, at my practice site who don't have any research experience and so there are opportunities to get involved in a little bit of like clinical analysis and some data analysis of clinical problems even at that stage and have it be really meaningful. So I don't know that there's a time when students have to get involved. I think any amount of research exposure at any point in the curriculum is a really positive thing. Uh, but I'm just starting to see it much earlier in students, and I think it speaks to the drive that students have and also knowing how competitive postgraduate opportunities are becoming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the the earlier is the better mm -hmm. always. In, you know, now sometimes I see uh, some high school students, you know, coming to Drake to do some uh, lab bench research or other clinical also. So it's always uh, good um, if students are interested to start early uh, because, uh, you know, they will learn from the research and you don't need to know the theory just to do the practice. Uh, so um, I, I say, you know, the earlier the better. And later on, they may not have enough time, you know, when they are P3s and P4s, they will be more involved in other activities and they may not have the time to come to the lab. So sometimes I will have you know, students that would say, I really want to do research. I really <laughs> want to get involved. And then we will start talking. And then, uh, then I see how the time is so short. They also, you know, the time is very you know, constrained. And therefore, they will come once a week. And after a certain time, they will say, oh, I'm sorry, I have to stop the research. And then I see the pain in their eye. You know, it's just they have to because they can. So, mm -hmm. um, so um, I think there is no time for that. So research can be started as early as possible. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And what do you believe is most important about becoming involved in research as a student? I, I think the, um, there are a number of advantages that can be, you know, uh, um, uh, get from this. Uh, first is the contact with the professor, to have, you know, personal contact mm -hmm. and to know them closely and to understand them. Uh, and from the scientific perspective, you know, when they do research, they will start uh, putting this critical question and they are a problem solver because when I accept students to my lab, I'm not 
taking them as lab technician so they are actually involved in research like you in generating data and we don't know the problem so there will be always a problem when you do research and <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> that's why re there is research because there is problem <laughs> yeah. so um, that solving problem is an additional learning opportunity for the student mm -hmm. i know we've definitely had experiences with in the lab, it seems over the summer there is all almost. Yeah. It's not necessarily a problem every single day, but new questions coming about every single day. Yeah. And, yes, yes, yeah. and you see those questions only when you do the research. Yes, because uh, I don't know what will happen when you do those research because uh, you're not repeating a procedure that's already done. You are discovering new things. That's mm -hmm. a research, it's a new thing. So nobody knows the answer before we do it. So we have some expectation, like, you know, hypothesis or, you know, that you know what's going to happen, uh, but you are not sure until you do it. And yes. there are a lot of, uh, you know, problems that will happen in between. Mm -hmm. Yes, and it's definitely been easy to see the translation into my classes. Now that I'm a P1, I'm able to see they're learning about excipients and pharmaceutics, and I've already had to learn about that, or about certain excipients in our project, or um, calculations in your class this semester. So. Exactly. I, I also use the research to teach uh, in the class, because when I talk about certain topic, I will tell about my research experience, what we are doing in that area, uh, so that will complement the teaching so the research mm -hmm. and the teaching are always you know uh, hand to hand you know so they go together so one supports the other so I get some idea for the teaching from my research at the same time you know uh, the research um, and the teaching go together yeah. yes we do and let's see would you recommend research to all students or do you believe just students who know they have an interest in it all students definitely as long as they have time and interest. <laughs> yes. Because I see research, uh, as I said it before, is a one branch of learning. Mm -hmm. So when you do research, you are also learning. Uh, so when I do research, I'm also teaching. When I teach, also I'm you know, collecting information for my research. So they are always, they go hand to hand. So uh, even if it's not lab-based research, you know, I encourage every student to do something searching for more information than just the classroom uh, lecture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I I would echo a lot of that. I think my mo the most important thing that I think about being involved in research is finding the passion for it and, and wanting to do that. And I think answering that question would answer, should all students do it? Because it, some students are not interested mm -hmm. in that. And it would be painful to conduct research <laughs> if yes. you're not interested in it. And so yeah. finding projects you're passionate about or finding questions that you're passionate about, I think are really important to wanting to do it and wanting to keep coming back to the lab or back to the clinic or back to the hospital, whatever your setting is to actually get the research done. And it's, it's important to have that fire instead of a checkbox on your list of things that you need to do. And, so I could go either way. I think the critical analysis skills that come from research are invaluable. I hope every student has those opportunities to get the critical analysis skills. Uh, but if they're not interested or they're not passionate about a project that they're working on, maybe trying to find a different project or maybe it's it's not a, a venue that they need to continue to explore. So it really is dependent on the student and what they bring to the project and what they get out of the project. Mm -hmm. and is how is how I look at it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, and this project is a unique crossroads between the pharmaceutical sciences and the clinical and applied sciences. So could you both briefly explain what the difference is and what your typical research activities are because they typically don't merge the way this project does. So for maybe students who don't know what the differences might be. Yeah, exactly. This, this project is very interesting because uh, I have a collaborator, Lynn, that a clinician. Uh, so um, it is more applied and applicable to the clinical world. So uh, that translation is always very important and uh, it's highly encouraged, you know, to do that. Uh, and 
collaboration is very important in research um, and the more you have collaborators the better the result will be because nobody is perfect in everything so <laughs> <laughs> I, I know more on the pharmaceutical aspect how it is made uh, but you now Lynn Dr. Castle will bring the clinical perspective to the whole problem and see it from a different angle. So that makes it really very interesting. Uh, other than that, um, I, as I said, my research areas are more into the chemical stability of the drug because that chemical stability of the drug will determine the, the shelf life of the product. So that shelf life is one component of drug development and design. Uh, so uh, I'm not a clinician, so I don't see it from the patient's side, but I always try to do that. <laughs> uh, and when I have a clinical collaborator, that is much easier to see it from that angle. Mm -hmm. And my research is primarily uh, taking patient data and finding what the problems are. So are we being safe with our choices and medications? Are the choices that we're making with medications um, causing harm? Are they causing other problems that are maybe unintended problems? Are we solving issues or are we uh, maybe we have to factor in cost and affordability of medications and so it is a lot more about the patient. However, I use a lot of the foundational sciences for is this the right drug for this patient and that feeds back to pharmacology and is this uh, the right delivery system for the pa for this particular patient and that feeds back to pharmaceutics and does this patient have the right anatomy to absorb this medication and so that goes back to pharmacokinetics and so a lot of what I do in research is about the patient data but those foundational pieces are are definitely the undertones of making those decisions that we need to make to provide the care that we're providing for patients. So this project I think is really unique because I have worked with HPLC before. Um, it's just been a while since I've done that. And so getting back into it and seeing chromatograms and talking more about reagents, those are not things that I spend my time on on a daily basis. Um, but yet they're so foundational to being able to find what we want and hope to find in this. And so it's really nice to, again, have collaborators and have a strong collaboration team because when you can rely on your teammates to know something or do something that you don't know or can't do, that makes the project a lot easier. And so if I were attacking this from just a clinical perspective or a bedside perspective, I would have a lot different answers than knowing what the concentrations are and knowing how um, what the chromatograms look like. And so it's very different to have that information and also translate it. And so I think having a really strong collaboration team makes this really unique in addition to translating across all the disciplines that we have around our table right now. Great. Well, thank you so much for speaking with me today. Support for this episode comes from the audiobook Memorizing Pharmacology, a relaxed approach. With over 9,000 sales in the United States, United Kingdom, and Australia, it's the go-to resource to ease the pharmacology challenge. Available on Audible, iTunes, and Amazon.com. In print, ebook, and audiobook. Thank you for listening to the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast with your host, Tony Guerra. Be sure to share the show with the hashtag #PharmacyLeaders. 